me and you can take I'm ready to just kind of like settle in and let go of my week now and uh, you know it doesn't matter where we went and what was going and just we're here and we're with him and that's what we're here to do is to be with God enjoy being together with each other and to focus on him hey if you didn't get yourself some refreshments you're feeling a little weary today refreshments are in through here at the coffee bar it stays open the entire service so feel free to get yourself something bring it in and and to settle in just kind of make yourself at home if you don't have a program, I want to point those out to you. They look like this, and they're available back in the back. The programs will help you to follow along, have the scriptures, all kinds of good information about stuff that's going on here. And uh, if you're planning on coming to uh, Grilling and Chilling on Saturday, yeah. yeah, we're going down on Route 2. There's some land down there that uh, God continues to, to provide for us to hold on to. And so we're going to go down there and just kind of grill out and uh, have some good music and some good games and some good friends and just a chance to hang out and bring your family and your friends and your neighbors. That's a great chance to do that. If you're planning on coming, um, why don't you go ahead and uh, fill that out. You'll be able to drop that in the offering bag later on and uh, just kind of tell folks so we can get uh, an idea who's bringing food and things like that. Uh, also, well, last but not least, our connect card we ask everybody to fill out each week it's just a chance for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you uh, back and forth there uh, 
by far the most popular section is the part that says prayer requests and praises. It's on the back. If you fill that out, the builders here at LifeBridge will be praying for you starting this afternoon and continuing on throughout the week. So go ahead and fill out that Connect card and take that opportunity. Later on, you'll be able to fold that up, put it in the offering bag as it comes around, and uh, make that a part of your worship service. Why? Because we're here to worship, to focus on Him, to sing God's praises. And that's what we're going to do right now. Join with us. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Because you know what? There is no other God. He is the only one.
you are finally God created by human hands, and you are not a God dependent on any mortal man, you are not a God. Because we know that you are God alone and because we know that you are unchangeable and because we know that you take care of and provide for our every single need we can go from that and we can say
Loser. Loser. Tea party bigot. Socialist. Guilty as sin. In politics, in the courtroom, on the job, in everyday life, how do we pass judgment? If you meet somebody for the first time, it's just natural that you're going to form an opinion on what you think about that person. How you look, how you dress, your language, your poise, everything about you creates that impression. It says to us in human nature that we're not really good evaluators. People have snap decisions and they don't care. We got to be careful about passing judgment, don't we? As the story goes, there was this uh, little church where, uh, well, Gertrude was well known for being the uh, church gossip. Y y you know what it was like. She's uh, always kind of watching over people's shoulders and coming up with decisions about who, who was in the church and what it was that they were up to. People didn't really confront her about it because they were kind of afraid of her. If you went to confront her, then all of a sudden she's going to start talking about you. So they just kind of keep it to themselves until a new man came into the church by the name of Joe. Now, Joe wasn't a Christian. He finally gave his life to Christ. And uh, Gertrude was very quick to talk about Joe and uh, got right in his face after he came to Christ. She says, now you know what you need to do is you got to stop being a drunk you got to stop being such an alcoholic because everybody in the town knows that you're an alcoholic because you got your truck sitting out there in front of the only town bar all day long. And with it parked out there, well, they know that, uh, well, you're in there all day long. Joe just sat and listened to her. He didn't say anything. He didn't try to fight, didn't try to justify his actions. He just quietly left the church building, went out, got into his truck, drove down to Gertrude's house, parked his truck in front of her house, got out and left. He left the truck there all night long. <laughs> Went back the next day and picked it up. We've got to be careful about passing judgment, don't we? And it's a great thing. If you come on down on Friday night, you can be a part of the conversation. Life Tree Cafe, what we call a conversation cafe, where we talk about some of these tough topics. And it is tough because we have a tendency to make a first impression in that first few moments of talking to somebody and meeting them. And, and we need to get ourselves to the point where we get past that and start seeing the people who are there. And that's actually the purpose of this series. The series that we're in right now is about trying to understand people more and where they are coming from. It's not about judging or putting them into a box, but simply trying to understand where they're coming from so that we can reach out to them and share God's love with them in a very practical way. Well, today we're going to be talking about a group of folks that it's really hard to put into a box, actually. It's not even a, a, a religion, although it is, it is called a world religion. Uh, a lot of times, folks within this belief system or their faith system will not refer to it as a religion, but will refer to it as a, a philosophical system, uh, a, a philosophy or a way of life or a culture, if you will. Now, it's a very old group uh, that has been around for a long, long time, since before 1500 B.C., uh, and if you talk to folks in this group, what you're going to find is that there are various gods that start to pop up. Sometimes they don't believe in a god at all. Sometimes they believe in this god or this one or this one. Or sometimes they believe in lots of gods. Sometimes when you're talking to someone in this group, what they really believe or see is that they are a part of the great God being that exists out there and they will become a part of that when they leave this life. They believe a lot of times in karma. Now, you've heard the, the, the term karma, right? Uh, and karma is, is talking about that cycle of life and death that, uh, that they'll see in our lives. Basically, what karma says is that if I do bad things, bad things will come back to me. If I do good things, then good things will come back to me. That's basically the way karma works. And when you take that and add that to another piece of their belief system, which is reincarnation, Essentially what you'll do is find people who are trying to be good and do better and do better and do better throughout this life 
And when they come back in the next life, they will continue that process. If they continue to get better and better, eventually they will become one with the spirit world, which actually we are not really seeing or experiencing properly with the flesh and blood that we have right now. There are six, seven different major schools of philosophy within this group. And the one that you would know about is one that uh, we don't think of as a philosophical group. It's one we think of for exercise, and that is yoga. But yoga is not, in fact, just an exercise system. Yoga uh, comes out of this philosophical and theological background where it's a belief system, and to be sure, you can lower your heart rate, and you can go ahead and calm your body, and you can stretch it in ways that you never thought possible, okay? But really what you're trying to do within yoga is empty yourself of the flesh world out here and be a part of the spirit world and let go of all the stuff that gets in the way of you experiencing that spirituality. The group we're talking about here today is called Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism. Now, Hinduism is, a, is an old religion, and it's a, uh, uh, a big uh, philosophical system or religious system that is out there. Uh, in fact, it's so old that it, it brings me to ask this question. For those of you who are using the uh, online Bible with you version, you can go ahead and, and do the survey online. Uh, or we'll just go ahead and do the survey with a raise of hands for the rest of, of us here. What is uh, often referred to as the oldest living religion? What is referred to oftentimes as the oldest living religion? Is it Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, or Judaism? Who has that reputation of the oldest living religion uh, out of these four? Uh, who would say Christianity? Let's see, raise of hands there. Everybody says, nope, we know Christianity is young. Okay, uh, Islam, who would say that is the oldest living religion? Nobody's got Islam on that list. Nobody wants to raise their hand on Islam. Okay, uh, Hinduism, who would say that one? Okay, we got a lot of them here for Hinduism. And how about Judaism? Judaism, we got a bunch of them here for Judaism as well. It's interesting, the phrase oldest living religion is most often applied to Hinduism, although I am with many of you who in the camp of Judaism, uh, I, would, I would argue that point as well. As long as Hinduism and, and some of those earlier religions that have been around, um, pieces of it that have been around, that's how long Judaism has been around as well. So uh, I would throw it into the same category and, and give them a tie right there. Now, as you move along within the Hindu philosophies and backgrounds and so forth, starting as far back as 2000, 3000 BC and moving on up till recent days, what you'll see is that there are large uh, groups of people that follow specific philosophers and specific teachers within that grouping. One of them, the, the most common one that we think about, is uh, in fact uh, Buddha. And Buddha lived in uh, five. 63 BC and called himself a teacher. He was a teacher that came around um, and people will refer to him. Buddha actually means awakened one or enlightened one. So he kind of he kind of took Hinduism to the next step, if you will. And a lot of folks feel that way. And so they follow his way. At the point in time when he was teaching, <clears throat> many of the people that were practicing uh, this faith system were really into what we call asceticism. And what they were into was uh, things like fasting for long periods of time and uh, doing things to, to um, uh, not feed their bodies because they wanted to feed their souls. And so uh, some of these things started to get very uh, uh, extreme. Okay, And folks who were watching that, they were going, I don't know if that gets us closer to what it is that we're shooting for or not. Well, Buddha was one of them. And Buddha came along and he actually was the champion of what we refer to as the middle way. In other words, you can live kind of a normal life, if you will, and still be very spiritual and grow closer uh, to where they're reaching. They're not trying to grow closer to God. They're trying to cl grow closer to being God or uh, being more spiritual or being more good. Well, 
Buddha said, I'm going to skip that third line there, but uh, Buddha said he uh, is not a man. Uh, he was more enlightened than that and was better than that, was further along, if you will, than the rest of us, which is what qualified him to be a teacher and to be able to share with us. He did not claim to be a god. He was not there yet and had not gone that far, but he was certainly more enlightened and was able to share with us. And of course, that faith system that we understand is Buddhism. Uh, that came straight out of these Hindu roots. Before, when we had that list up there, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, those three are actually in the order uh, for the number of people that adhere to those belief systems around the world. Christianity is the largest religious system around the world at this point. Islam comes in second. And uh, the third would be Hinduism. And then there are several of them that would be kind of fighting for that fourth place. Buddhism would be fighting for that fourth place right along with them. Now, uh, as I think about this, I, I don't know if you have friends or family members or neighbors who are uh, coming from these backgrounds and these philosophies, Hinduism, Buddhism. Uh, you might be sitting there saying, Pete, we're in northwest Indiana. I mean, really? Uh, we're going to be doing Buddhism today? We're, we're talking about that? I, you know, I don't have anybody that, that, that's connected in that way. Well, I, I, you, you might be surprised. Actually, Buddhism and Hinduism, the philosophies that are built into that, that mindset, actually have become a part of our culture uh, for many of us without even recognizing that it happened. For me, as a, as a young man, uh, uh, actually a teenager, uh, it came about when this, uh, this movie came out that was just absolutely the greatest movie that I had ever seen. Um, my, my mom let me go see it. That was part of what made it the greatest movie ever. But I went into that movie, and, and uh, they, had, they had heroes that, that wore white. They had villains that wore black. They had spaceships that were taking off and going all over the place. They had firefights that were happening out there, and people shooting these guns, but lights came out of the guns. And would choo, 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 you know, and it was... Things are blown up. We came out of that movie. My friends are talking. We're talking really fast. And, Did you see that part? And then it went over here. And it went, yeah, it was awesome. And we're going on talking about how great this movie was. I am such a guy, right? And it just... It was terrific. And the bad guy, when he would come walking in, they had this big bad guy music. And then he'd come in and go... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Star Wars. The first one. I don't care if they call it number four now. It was the first one. And that's what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, this whole number four thing just messes me up. But that was the first one we went and we saw it. Now, do you notice how good and evil was portrayed in there when somebody was was wishing well you were wishing good and wishing well for them we would say may the force be with you and of course good christian boy that i was as i was growing up i said oh it's a head fake toward may the lord be with you because we would do that in church all the time it wasn't a head fake toward may the lord be with you Remember what happened to Obi-Wan Kenobi when he died? He didn't actually die. He finally kind of became a part of the force, which is the ultimate goal in Hinduism, is to kind of become a part of the greater good spirit being that exists out there. It's an impersonal spirit being force that we can tap into. And it very much ties into this mindset and philosophy. It permeates our culture. It's in our movies, in our science fiction. It's in our lives. And in later years, we didn't refer to it. People won't say, well, I'm a Hindu. Although what they would say are things like, uh, well, I'm kind of new age, which is very much a Hindu background. Um, you start rolling things together and putting together whatever you like from your different religions. And what you're going to find is that oftentimes you will come into a church just like this. And somebody goes to LifeBridge and, yeah, I go to LifeBridge, but I don't believe all the stuff that's in the Bible. You know, I mean, it, it's good. 
and, and Pete's all right, but the coffee's really good. <laughs> and the music rocks, okay? And so they come because that's what they like and that's what they're, they're, they're coming. And so you, you might find people that you're sitting right next to that are kind of putting all these pieces together and kind of doing a roll your own religious belief system. We face this, we are touched by this all over in our culture and with our own friends and family. This is a part of our lives. So as I was thinking about what to share about these philosophies and mindsets, I just picked a few things to try to help you to recognize when you're starting to stray from what God has shared with us through his word and through his prophets and through his son and where it starts to take us to a, a, a more, what I would call, dangerous place. Um, all the way back in the book of Exodus, God's talking to the Israelites. He's actually speaking to Moses, and he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation for those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generation for those who love me and keep my commandments. First thing that I want you to notice is that this was being shared with Moses in 1500 B.C., back when that oldest religion of Hinduism supposedly existed, and it did exist, it's what God was talking about when he said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship any of those other gods. I, your God, am a jealous God, and I will not stand for it. I will not allow it. Yeah, it was an old religion. It is an old religion. It's been around ever since God has been saying, don't follow that. It was what he was referring to when he said, don't follow that. Because there is one God, only one God, not lots of them, not uh, some great spirit being that we all become a part of if we do well enough in this life and finally understand and become enlightened. There is a God that is a personal God who personally wants to be involved in your life. He expresses love. He expresses anger. He, he speaks with us and he listens to us. He interacts with us. He teaches us and trains us. He warns us about things that are going to get us in trouble and cause problems in our lives. He is involved in our lives. And so... We even give a, a designator of he to him, even though we know that there is no masculine or feminine to God. We just know that God is a personal being that does communicate with us, act with us, speak with us, wants to have a relationship with us. And so we worship that one God. When you're talking to somebody that starts to talk about multiple gods or philosophies or just kind of throwing things and mishmashing things together, then, then there should be some lights and sirens going off in your head saying, okay, well, first of all, you're not going to bash them for that, but you should also recognize for yourself, this is where we're straying off, off the path that is with God. Here's another thing I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> Thessalonians is a good example. There's other passages throughout Scripture that make this very clear. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Those that you, uh, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and then he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's will... We tell you that we who are still alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Scripture clearly tells us that there is not a multiple life reincarnation scenario that we are a part of. We're just not. It's one time and out. You got one shot at this, and it's now. It's here. It's this life. Now, it may not seem like a big deal to you, but think about this. How would you change your decisions about today if you knew today was your last day? How would you change your decisions about this week if you knew this week was your last week? Would you change anything about your life if you knew this life was your last life? Your only chance to live this life. This is your only opportunity to get it right. What would you choose? How would you spend that time? Um, we've had, it seems like, a, a lot of folks that have been hurting in, in the hospital and um, in and out and, and, uh, and so forth uh, in, in recent weeks and months. And one of the folks that we have that's actually in, in the hospital right now is in a, a cancer treatment center. She's a, a younger lady. It's Jenny Bolton's sister. And uh, she was diagnosed with leukemia. She's over in Chicago in a cancer treatment center where she's going through all the things that you go through, I guess, when you have leukemia, and they're trying to stop that so that she can have life for longer. They're doing blood transfusions, I, I, you know, oil change, right? They're swapping it all out <laughs> completely. Uh, they're doing uh, chemotherapy. They, she just finished her last chemo. Um, and so we're, we're praying that, that God uses that and that that heals uh, her. She got a plasma treatment that was her last plasma treatment because she cannot um, get any more because they're out right now. And it just hit home how real this is when we have a, a, a blood mobile van out front and we're encouraging people to give blood today. But this is very personal. This is very real for people right here uh, in our own community, uh, part of our family. Um, They've told me that when you give uh, blood over there, actually, most people don't need whole blood. I, I don't completely understand this, but they've got technology. They can do this stuff. They can remove the white blood cells and the red blood cells. And, and so uh, one thing of blood that you give actually can help two, three different patients because they can take pieces of that and use that uh, in the ways that those patients need that. Um, If you only have this life to live, how do you spend it? What kinds of things do you do? What do you make important? What do you make priorities? Uh, these are things that we think about. It's totally different if you think, well, I got another life when I'm done with this one. I mean, seriously, it totally changes your perspective. I got another one. Well, I got another one after that and another one after that. It's not that big of a deal, you know? I mess this one up. There's always next time. But when you realize there's not always next time, it, it adds some urgency to things. You start to, to change your perspective in things. It starts to change you. I know that sharing our faith is not an easy thing to do. And uh, it, it can be complicated, uh, difficult to, to share our faith with folks. But one of the things that, that I do every week is uh, I get together actually with various small groups. And I'm grateful for the time that I spend with those groups. It's a chance for, for us to dive into the Word, to be sure. It's a chance for us to get to know each other, so we're spending life on life with each other. Uh, it's a chance for us to help each other through this journey that we call life and to draw closer to God as a result of this journey that we are in. 
It helps us prepare for eternity. And so I'm very grateful for the groups that I get to be a part of and the people that I get to be a part of their lives and they are a part of mine as well through those groups. I really want to encourage you to get into one if you haven't yet. And we've got a great opportunity for you to do it. In uh, just a couple of weeks, the first week of October, we're going to start a six-week series across all of our small groups, which is focused on helping us share our faith with our friends, our family members, and our neighbors. It, it, is, it is so easy. Uh, you don't need a theology degree or need to go to, to seminary in order to be able to do this. It is really helping you to discover and to work with your own story and how God has worked in your life so it becomes personal to you. And it gives you a chance to practice it with people who are trying to do the same thing and feel nervous about it as well. And so you build friendships while you're doing it. That's going to take place in the actual small groups. If you look in your program, that's what we're referring to by contagious Christian small groups. Those are the groups that are going to begin uh, doing this Contagious Christian series with the first week of October, going through October and then into the beginning of November. Six weeks, starting the first week of October. Would you do me a favor? Would you look on the list and find something that fits your schedule? I mean, I know we're all busy. And I know there's a lot of stuff that tries to get in the way. This week, for whatever reason, was just a week of, of personal mental distractions whenever I would try to pray and get in the Word. It, it was like a battle every time I tried to sit down and read and every time I tried to sit down and pray. Now, I fought the battle and I, I read and I prayed. And, and I'm blessed because of it and I hope that others are as well because I prayed for them. But um, sometimes it is a little bit of a battle. Sometimes you just got to say, I've only got one life, and this is important. This is more important than. And then pick whatever the thing is that it's more important than. Sometimes we've got to set something else aside in our schedule in order to make this the priority that it deserves to be. So that we draw near to God and draw near to one another. Take a look at the list. Uh, we, we try to put pictures on there. I know they're kind of small pictures, or maybe I'm just getting older, uh, and so they look smaller. But we try to put some pictures on there so that uh, you can see the folks who are hosting the groups and leading the groups. And the idea is, okay, I think I can do this on Tuesday night. And then I look at the picture and I go, oh, that's Pete and Tracy. That is me, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Uh, standing in the woods. That's a beautiful portrait. Anyway, so then you go and you find the person that, that matches the picture, and you can ask them questions. I think we have contact information, or the, the dates and the times that we're meeting as well. And the idea is um, you can either just come at that date and time, or uh, you can talk to one of us and uh, get to know us, and we can connect up and, and uh, get you going there so that you know where to, where to meet. Why? Well, because it's about walking together with God in this life and preparing for the next. And part of our walk with Him in this life is, is making Him first in everything. I asked you on your Connect cards to fill out prayer requests. That's an act of making God first in our lives. I'm taking what's important to me and I'm laying it before Him and saying, I trust you, God. Um, when we give financially, we're actually going to do that right now. That's an act of making him first in our lives and saying, okay, God, you've given all this to me. I know that this is important to you, and so I'm going to give to this and give financially for that. You never need to feel pressured to give financially, but I really want to encourage you to participate in this part of the service when we, when we give our gifts. And so if you filled out that Connect card, Take that and fold it up. Put it in the offering bag as it comes around. If you have a prayer request on there, turn that request over to God and just say, God, I I trust you. I'm putting this in your hands. Let's go ahead and give our gifts to him at this time.
the last piece that I wanted to share with you today uh, about this philosophy and this mindset, this religious system, is best uh, described by God's word itself. And so I want to share some of these passages with you. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that, he, that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their, their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. And Jesus was talking to a crowd. He said, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will turn to those on His right, and He will say, Come, You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he'll turn to those on his left and he'll say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Now, you, those of you who know this particular story, you know I cut out large sections of it, right? <laughs> they were the sections where the group of people said, well, I don't understand. Why am I on the right? Why, how did we possibly, what, what did we do to deserve to go with you? And he said to the left, and, and they went, well, wait a minute. Why are we on your left? What, what did we do to deserve this? And Jesus said to those on the right, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was homeless, you housed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. You cared for me. And they said, when did we do that? And he said, well, whenever you did it for the least of these, my brothers and sisters. Folks, if there's something about LifeBridge that that I get kind of confusion and people scratching their heads and asking me questions about on a regular basis... It is, why do you do so much stuff? You know, you're you're doing a blood drive today, and then you're you're going down and you're doing grilling, chilling on the land at the end of the week. And then, you know, we're we're diving into, we just had bunko for 500 turkeys and raised over $3,000 to help feed people for Thanksgiving. And... And then we're, we're going to feed 500 families for Thanksgiving, but that's not going to be good enough because then we're going to go into to February and we're going to be, we're going to be helping ladies that, that are coming from a shelter where they've been battered and abused and, and they need healing and, and need to come back. We, we raised over 8,000 pounds of food for the, for the Northwest Indiana Food Bank uh, not all that long ago, and we'll end up doing that kind of thing again. And... And as we're doing all of these things and clothing drives and so forth, and people say, it's, it's like you guys never stop. You're always doing stuff. And we go, well, yeah. That's what Jesus told us to do. And we only got one life. Better live it well. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. For those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But to the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all the liars... They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. It's never a teaching that anybody likes. But there will be one judgment. 
that will take place on one day. And on that day, we will stand before our God. And He will judge all of us by our actions, our lives, what we have done. And then He will open up the book of life. And if He finds our name in the book of life, He will say, like He said to the ones on the right, Come with me. You will be with me for eternity. Come to the place that my Father has prepared for you. The thing is that the way that we get in that book of life is through the actions of not ourselves, but of our God Himself, who came down and laid down His life for us. He came down and died so that we would not receive the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not a, a, a concept that we like to hear about. You certainly don't want to hear Pete preach about it. The wrath of God is found all the way through Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, all the way to the last book, the book of Revelation. And if you want to see how great the fury and wrath of God is against those who are turned against Him, those who are His enemies, those who are sinning and hurting those around them, those who turn against God in rebellion, read the book of Revelation sometime. Rivers of blood. It's not something that we like to read. That wrath is turned away by Jesus' death on the cross. That wrath is stopped because He laid His life down for us. That wrath was poured out on Jesus when He went to the cross. And that is what we remember when we take communion each week. As we take the bread, we remember that His body was broken and as we drink from the cup, we remember His blood was poured out. We remember that that is a day that the wrath of God is turned away from those of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ and have made Him our Savior and the Lord of our lives. Folks, I need you to catch this. That wrath that was reserved for you is also reserved for your best friend and your neighbor, your co-worker, your family member who has not come to God through Jesus Christ yet. As we take communion today, don't just thank God for the grace that He has given you, but ask Him to bring to mind those that He needs you to invite that he is calling you to reach out to so that you will bring them with hopes that they will walk together with God through Jesus as well let's take communion now and remember God's grace Lost in love I am Sweetly
friend of mine who gave me a call not too long ago. I hadn't spoken to him in, in many years, and, uh, and he gave me a buzz. He's got a restaurant up here in, in Chicago. Uh, it's like a Chicago dog place, and um, he said he had a guy that came in there, was talking to him, and tried to evangelize him, basically, uh, invite him to his new church that he was starting up and so forth, and he, he just kind of chuckled. He says, you know, you remind me of an old friend of mine that I lost touch with. I need to get in, in touch with him, and so he sought me out and, and found me on one of my whatever things that are out there, Facebook, LinkedIn, something, whatever, and, uh, and, and gave me a call, and we just got a chance to talk for a little bit, which was, which was great. Now, as a part of this guy's wedding, it was the most eclectic thing I, I have had the pleasure of being a part of. Uh, he had a little Judaism thrown in there. Uh, he had a, a little Hindu stuff going on. He had a little bit of this, a little bit. Threw a little Christianity in there for my sake because he knew I was going to school, you know, to, to be a pastor. In our conversation recently, he was telling me how karma is such a rough thing to deal with, you know, uh, as he is living out his life. He's a good guy, and I like him. I can't stand the thought of not spending eternity with him. See, if we truly love our neighbor as ourselves, this becomes a part of the question. Do we love them enough to share our faith with them? Now, as I was talking to him back when we worked together some 15 years ago. Uh, we would talk about uh, faith kinds of things. We'd go out to lunch together and so forth. And I, and I ended up saying to him, you know what? And I, I called him by name and I, I said, if you are right and I'm wrong, it's not going to hurt you a bit to come to my church. Because what are you going to hear from my church? How to love God and love your neighbor as yourselves. You're going to learn how to, you know, you're going to be here and hearing and being encouraged to do good things and, and helpful to people and, 
and be a part of great projects and so forth. It's not going to hurt you a thing to come to my church because you're trying to become somebody who is doing what is good and holy anyway. Come on down. I mean, I didn't even have a coffee bar to offer him. <laughs> but if I'm right and you're wrong and you don't come, well, I don't even want to think about that. I really don't. Because I care about you too much. It didn't get him to come to church. <laughs> but it did get us talking about the Bible and starting to do some Bible studies together. And we still got a ways to go. And I continue to pray for him. And I continue to hope and pray that somebody that's right there will invite him to church. And that he'll go. Folks, I'm hoping and praying that you'll invite somebody to church and that they'll go. Because this is far too important. And we only have one life. And so do they. It's time for us to reach out, to share our faith. And right now, that level of sharing can just be inviting them to a great church in an ex-Chinese restaurant with a coffee par and music that rocks and time that flies by on Sunday mornings and we leave and we're refreshed knowing that we've drawn near to God. Invite him. For Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. As I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. And don't miss this. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on that last day. Folks, as we go from here, know that God is with you. Draw on His power and strength and wisdom to reach out to your friends and invite them to come as well. As you go from here, know that it is the Father's will that they see Jesus and that their names be written in the book of life as well. We praise that, Father. Father, we do praise you. We sing your praises, we speak your praises, and we give everything up to you. We ask you to fill our hearts and minds with your Spirit so that we'll go out and do what frightens us and bring up the conversation of faith and you and invite our friends to you. Help us to do that this week, Lord, to make that the priority that you want it to be because we know that we only have this life before eternity and our friends the same way. Strengthen us in this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Folks.